go on a long and circuitous route, and I'll only arrive at that again at the end. So there's been a battle going on for a long time about the nature of artificial intelligence, or what its nature should be. There's two very different approaches. They're very different ideologies. Um, one is inspired by logic. And so the idea is that the essence of intelligence is using symbolic rules to manipulate symbolic expressions. And the people who believed this, or the people who believed it, um, didn't think this was empirical. They thought that's the only way you could have intelligence. They thought it was a sort of necessary truth that that's what intelligence was going to be. There's a different set of people um, who were equally ideological, who believed that if you want to make an intelligent system, you should look to biology, and in particular, you should try and understand how the brain was doing it. And it doesn't look as if the brains of animals are doing it by logic. Of course, there's all sorts of debates about whether animals are intelligent, but um, the biologically inspired people thought that the essence of intelligence was learning the connection strengths in the neural network. And you can see these are two completely different worldviews. They, they kind of miss each other. Um, so there's a battle went on for a long time. In the 1960s, the, we had very simple neural nets, and we had a simple learning algorithm for them. They only had one layer of features, and they were completely wiped out by symbolic AI. So when I started in graduate school in the 1970s, it was well known that neural networks were nonsense, they were the past, they would never do anything, and it had been proved that they were useless. That's what I was told. And that's what almost everybody now believed. Then in the 1980s, um, various groups came up with the backpropagation procedure, and that allowed neural networks to learn multiple layers of features. So we got over this problem that until then, neural networks just had hand-designed features, they waited those features to make a decision, and then they made a decision. They didn't learn their own features. With backpropagation, we could learn layers of features, and there's a lot of hype about how this was going to solve everything. Um, that's what I believed. That is, I believed in the 80s that what's happening today was going to happen then, and it didn't. In the 1990s, um, people showed that there were other machine learning algorithms that work better than backpropagation on modest size problems, things called support vector machines. They had fancier math, and they worked a little bit better on what we now think of as very small problems, things with a few thousand training examples. So neural networks were wiped out again. Then, in about 2006, we came up with some technical improvements to neural networks that made them a bit easier to learn. And that wasn't the main point. At that time, we got more computation and more data. And suddenly, neural networks with lots of laser features worked amazingly well. And now Google and Facebook and Microsoft and Apple and Amazon and all the other high-tech companies you can think of, NVIDIA for one, are all betting the farm on neural networks. They believe that's certainly to be the future. And there's a huge demand for students who know anything about neural networks. So the old way to make a computer do what you wanted was to write a program where you figured out how you would do it yourself. And then you explained to the computer in exquisite detail how to do what you would have done yourself, but a whole lot faster. So if I wanted to sort a list, for example, I would figure out, well, I'm not a computer scientist, as you'll quickly realize. I would figure out, well, I could go down the list and find the biggest thing and then put that at the top. And then I could go down the list again and find the next biggest thing and put that underneath the first thing. It's not a good algorithm, but I might decide to do it like that. And then I could tell the computer to do that, and then the computer would sort a list faster than I could. The new way to do it is to, you first tell the computer to pretend to be a neural network, and then you just show it examples. So you show it an example of an unsorted list and a sorted list. And you show it lots of examples, and you say, I want you to take these things and produce those things. And after a while, it gets the idea. That is, you don't have to write the program. Sorting lists is something that's difficult to do this way. Recognizing objects and images is something that's much easier to do this way. So here's an example of something we'd like computers to do. And people in classical AI tried to do this for 50 years, and they didn't make much progress. So the idea is you're given the RGB values of a whole bunch of pixels. <coughs> and you have to convert those to a caption that describes what's in the image. So you get all these numbers coming in, and you have to have a string of words coming out. And 
You can imagine how you might go about writing a program to do that, but you can imagine it's going to be difficult. You first of all would maybe write a program to find little pieces of edge in the image or maybe color contrast. And just doing the vision would be more than you could do. And then relating the vision to the language would be complicated. Now what we can do is we can solve that problem just by using machine learning um, with hardly any hand programming. And by the end of the lecture, you'll understand how we do that. Okay, is that louder? <laughs> okay, I think the mic was turned on. Um, so, I'm going to explain, many of you know this already, but I'll explain what an artificial neuron is. It's a little computational device that's a little bit like a real neuron, but not very. It takes some inputs coming typically from other neurons. It has weights on the connections. It takes the inputs times the weights, adds it up, that's its total input, and then it puts it through a nonlinear function. That nonlinear function on the right there is what we mostly use now, and that's its output. So basically that nonlinear function simply says, if you've got a lot of input, give a lot of output, and if your input's below a threshold, don't give any output. So it's called a rectified linear unit. And the question is, if you hook together a bunch of those guys, and you figure out a way to make those weights on the connections adapt, what can you do with it? So we typically hook them together by making multiple layers. This again is sort of neurally inspired. And if you look at a multi-layer neural network like that, the layers in the middle, it's hard to figure out what the weight should be. When you adapt those weights, in effect, you're deciding what features the neurons in the middle layer should detect. So the problem of adapting those weights and the problem of deciding what intermediate features do you want, they're the same problem. Now, I'm going to show you a way of learning those features um, that's uh, really stupid, but will definitely work. Um, we're going to give it inputs, and we're going to tell it what the right answer is, and then we're going to adapt the weights one at a time. So suppose we want something that will tell the difference between pictures of cats and pictures of dogs. We give it two outputs, one for cat, one for dog. And if you show it a cat, and the output for dog is higher than the output for cat, that's bad. Um, so we can show it a bunch of pictures and measure how well it's doing. And then we can pick one of the weights in the network, and we can change the value of that weight, and we can see if the network is doing better or worse than it was before. To see that, you need to show a bunch of examples. Um, if the change worked, we keep it. And then we do it again for another way. Now, I think you can see that that algorithm is going to have to show a bunch of examples for each weight. And if you've got a billion weights, it's going to be extremely slow. But that's what we want to do. We want to change weights in the direction that makes them help. That's all we're trying to do. We're just trying to do that efficiently. And backpropagation, which many of you know, but I'm not going to explain that, is just an efficient way of computing how to change the weights in the direction that will help reduce the discrepancy between what the network outputs and what you'd like it to output. And the big difference is that if you perturb the weights, you measure the effects of a changed weight on the output. And with backpropagation, you compute the effects. So if you know all the weights in the network, you don't have to measure, you can compute. And when you compute, you can compute for all the weights at the same time, what direction you should change them to help. You can't do that when you're measuring. You have to change them one at a time. Um, so, measure, so computing is much more efficient than measuring. Evolution can't do the same measuring. It can't do the same computing algorithm. Because in evolution, you change a gene, and then there's a whole developmental process in the environment, and you don't know all that, so you can't back propagate through it. So what evolution did was it came up with a brain so that it could use backpropagation. That's my idea. So in backpropagation, you go forwards through these layers, you compare with the correct answer, you backpropagate signals that allows you to compute for each weight what direction to change it in to make it work better. And we thought in the 80s that was problem solved. We can now learn lots of layers. And it didn't work very well. And we didn't know why it didn't work. Most people thought it didn't work because this is a stupid idea. That is the idea that you would take a network with random weights and you just showed a lot of data 
As a result of seeing this data, it'd be able to design all its own feature detectors and do very good performance of things like machine translation or recognizing objects and images or recognizing speech. Almost everybody in AI thought that idea was completely crazy. Um, a few of us didn't. A few of us just thought, we don't know why it's not working. It's obviously the right thing to do. And we discovered later, the reason it wasn't working was because computers were too slow and data sets weren't big enough. Um, if you'd said that in the 80s, people would have said, oh yeah, sure, if you had a bigger computer and more data, it would work. But look, it doesn't work. Um, it turned out that was right. And when we got a bigger computer and more data, it worked. Now, there were some technical things too, but it was mainly the increase in computer speed and data size that mattered. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples before I get back to the issue of what it thought is. Um, the example that probably had the most impact was in 2012. There was a big public competition where you have a thousand different types of object and a million training images, and you have to learn to recognize the different types of object. And there's a, a secret test set, um, so you can't tune on the test set. And it's counted as right if you get the correct class in your top five bets, because it's not clear what the right bet is for some of them. For example, you have an image which has a Dalmatian on the bowl of cherries, and um, same Dalmatian and same cherries, one of those is right, and if you say both, you're going to get it right. But you don't know which. So a lot of the best existing computer vision methods were used, and the results look like this. Um, the results at the top are where we are now. Um, the results below, two of my graduate students at the University of Toronto uh, managed to get 16% error. And then the best computer vision groups um, were getting more than 25%. So we almost halved the error rate. And that had a huge impact on computer vision. Almost overnight, that is within a year, um, all the leading people changed from um, doing hand tune things, doing what they were doing before, to doing neural nets. And so in 2011, if you sent a paper using neural nets to a computer vision conference, it would be rejected because it was using neural nets. And by 2015, if you sent a paper to a computer vision conference, it would be rejected if it wasn't using neural nets. It was really a big change. Okay. It was obvious if two grad students can beat the best computer vision researchers who've been doing this stuff for 30 years, then you're going to develop a lot further. And things did. By 2015, the error rate on image data was down to 5%, which is about the human error rate. And now it's down to 3%. It's incredibly good. Thing. So I'll just use, show you some examples of that kind of object recognition. So there's an image, and the right answer is cheetah. And if you look at the, what the neural net says, it's very confident that cheetah is the right answer. And it has a few other things that things aren't totally out of the question, like leopard and snow leopard and an Egyptian cat. So the point is, all its backup answers are very sensible answers. And notice that's not a sort of typical image of a cheetah. Half the head's missing, and it's a cheetah close up, right? It's not a sort of classic, it's not the diagram you'd make of a cheetah to show somebody what a cheetah is. Here's a bullet train. And you'll notice the bullet train probably occupies less than 10% of the pixels. The building in the background is much bigger. There's a platform, there's a person on the platform. But it sort of knows what the right answer is likely to be, because it's understood about the focus of images. Um, that you put the thing you want to attend to in the middle. And all its alternative answers are quite reasonable. Here's one where it gets it wrong. So the correct answer is hand glass. It thinks the best answer is scissors. And you can sort of see why it might think scissors. Um, you can see better why it might think frying pan. It, it doesn't understand that that thing that I think must be a chain isn't the handle of a frying pan. Basically, it needs glasses. Um, you can see why it says stethoscope. But the important thing here is that all the wrong answers are visually plausible wrong answers that give you an idea of that it understands a lot about what things look like. OK, so that had a huge effect on computer vision. And then a few years later, um, some very great people, including Ilya Satskiva, who was one of the people who did the um, 2012 ImageNet system, um, decided they'd try neural nets on machine translation. And machine translation 
ought to be the perfect problem for symbolic AI. So people in symbolic AI, I mean, we all agree that symbols come in and symbols come out. Okay? The question is, what's in between? Is it just more symbols? So the classic AI view is, symbols come in, what's inside is sort of like symbols. It's sort of cleaned up symbols. Um, it's symbolic expressions. And you do manipulations on symbolic expressions, and then another symbol string comes out. So it's all symbols. The biological view would be symbols come in, they're the way we code things to go over a communication channel. They resist noise nicely. Once the symbols have come in, they get converted into things that are nothing like those symbols. So the point about a symbol is it only has basically one property. A symbol either is or is not identical to another symbol. If you take two different symbols, the only property that matters is are they the same symbol? Okay? All the other properties are just arbitrary properties of the symbol that are not relevant to the process. In neural nets, what happens is a symbol comes in and it gets converted into a great big vector that has all sorts of features that capture lots of knowledge about the meaning of that word. And words that mean similar things but don't look similar, like Friday and Wednesday, they mean pretty similar things. They're distinct symbols. There's nothing, well, there's the morpheme structure of day. That's a bad example, but, but basically, um, they're, they're distinct symbols, and that's all a symbol processing system knows. In a neural net, it learns that Wednesday and Friday are very, very similar things, and we'll see that later. So, the symbolic AI approach to machine translation is to say, okay, a symbol string comes in in English, we're going to do some manipulations, using rules, and that we're clearly going to use rules of grammar, but we're also going to use semantic rules that somehow do compositional semantics. That is, given what the individual pieces mean, they figure out what a group of pieces must mean. Um, and then we're going to produce symbols coming in. And we're going to use all the knowledge that linguists have about how language works. The neural network approach, now, even I thought this was a bit crazy, a bit ambitious, um, is to say, Let's just take a whole bunch of translations, pairs of an English sentence and a French sentence. And we'll stick in the English sentence one word at a time. And then we'll go into a recurrent neural network, which I'll explain in a minute, where things cycle around inside. And after we finish sticking in the English sentence, that recurrent neural network will have some particular state of activity. And we'll call that a thought vector. That is, that's what a thought is. It's the state of activity of the neural net after it's read the English sentence. And you'll notice if you think about how the word thought works in English, I can say John.